Okay, friends, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. Uh, We're wrapping up this outstanding, deep, challenging section of Scripture today. I'm focusing on one verse, verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Uh, Before I ask God's blessing on our time of preaching, um, you'll notice the loud and slayers aren't here today. It's because all of them are sick. And so we can pray for them. And then uh, Deborah Barros just uh, told me that Marie is not feeling well. She's run into some kind of allergy type of thing. And so uh, please be praying for the Loudenschlagers and Miss Marie. And I'm sure there's others that are unwell as well. So keep those folks in mind. Let's ask God's blessing on the Loudenschlagers and Marie and then on the preaching of God's word. Gracious Lord, again, we just thank you and praise you that you are here with us, that you have not left, uh, left us without a witness. And you've given us your word Uh, that points back to the work of our Savior, Jesus. Lord, do think of your servants, the Loudenslaggers, and Miss Marie, and just ask for comfort, healing, and peace for them today. And bring them back here uh, so that we can worship you together as you would have us do. Open now our eyes to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you, um, if you've been uh, exposed to science for any length of time, will will know the word paradigm. Um, A paradigm is a framework containing the basic assumptions, ways of thinking, and methodology that are commonly accepted by members of a given community. Uh, typically, this is lining up with a scientific community. But, but if, you can, if you think of it this way, what I just said, it's, it's the basic assumptions, the ways of thinking, the methodologies that are commonly accepted by members of a given community. We could re- re- refer to that also as a philosophy or a worldview, right? We could do that. So when we think about a paradigm, then perhaps a a common term that you're familiar with is a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift. So if a paradigm is a framework or a worldview, a paradigm shift is a dramatic reordering or embracing of what? New basic assumptions, ways of thinking, and methodology that are commonly accepted by you or members of a given community. Let me give a couple of examples. Several of you will know the name Al Michaels. Okay, he is a sports caster. Yeah, okay, a couple, yeah, I know him. Okay, so he, he has a Sunday night football. If you turn on NBC tonight, he and Chris Collingsworth will be announcing the game. Uh, but, but the issue with him, that I, you'll, you'll remember him if you were alive at the time in 1980 at the 80 Olympics when the USA hockey team beat the Soviet Union in a massive upset And remember, at the end of that game, as the final seconds are ticking off, the announcer says, do you believe in miracles? Yes! That was Al Michaels. Okay, so Al Michaels back then was like, I don't know, 20 or 30-something. Well, he's 70-something now, and he just celebrated a birthday. And someone asked him, how... What, what, do you, what do you consider to be the key of life? You know, what, what, what makes life good? And he said, I've never let, I've never intentionally eaten a vegetable in my entire life. That's what he said. That, that's what makes life good. So anyway, what would be a paradigm shift for Al Michaels would be for him to become a raw vegan. Okay, does anyone know what a raw vegan is? Okay, a couple of you, yes. A raw vegan is someone who will only eat raw vegetables and fruit and nothing else. Okay, so... Al Michaels would do a paradigm shift from never letting a vegetable touch his mouth intentionally to becoming a raw vegan. That would be a paradigm shift. Okay, another example, my dear family embracing and not only embracing but enjoying football. That would be another paradigm shift, right? You guys understand that? What are they teaching you over there? Anyway, but but friends, those are kind of silly, fun ideas of paradigm shifts. But friends the most dramatic paradigm shift that will ever occur and has ever occurred is when God draws a rebellious, broken sinner to himself. That is the most massive paradigm shift that you will ever experience or anyone ever will. How does the scripture describe us? It says we were spiritually dead, right? Ephesians chapter 2. It isn't that you're drowning in the lake. You're in the bottom of the lake dead already. And God, what, makes you alive together with Christ. That's a massive change. We read in Ezekiel 36 that that God would take this heart of stone that is in us and replace it with a heart of flesh, one that is attentive and, and desirous of honoring God and following him and loving him as he has loved us. 
It's a completely new way of thinking, a new way of seeing the world. Many of you, praise God, came to Saving Faith very young, and so you can say, I just don't really know the world without the perspective of seeing it through the lens of Jesus. And if that's you, praise God. What a blessing that is that God did that for you. Many of us came to faith after we had pursued a life of wickedness and sin and rebellion for a while. And, whoa, what a change that was. It was dramatic for me. And, and we know this. The scriptures declare this. What? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So, friends, as we wrap up Romans 9 through 11 today, we've really been wrestling with paradigms. We've been wrestling with seeing history, with seeing Israel, with seeing ourselves the way God sees us and sees the world. And, and friends, as we've talked about over this entire time here, embracing, whether we can fully comprehend it, embracing the sovereignty of God in the election of sinners to salvation... And embracing the sovereignty of God in control of history, be it the history of the Jews, the history of the world, the history of you, and the history of me, this is something that we struggle with. Because why? We're limited. We can't see all of these things that God sees. But, but friends, brothers and sisters, I trust that as you have come to know Jesus Christ, you've come to know God through Jesus Christ, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, as you've wrestled with God's word, that paradigm shift has taken hold and it's growing and maturing and developing. Verse 36, friends, as we look at this today and wrap up this section, this perhaps, of other scriptures too, perhaps this one tells of God's absolute sovereignty and control over all things in one of the clearest and concisest, concisest? Clearest and concise statements in the whole of scripture for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever friends brothers and sisters if we would live rightly if we would worship as god would have us worship if we would be those who are fulfilling god's purpose for mankind according to the divines of the westminster confession the chief end of man is what to glorify god and enjoy him forever. Piper's rendition, chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Friends, if, if that would be us, we have to embrace the paradigm of God's absolute sovereignty over all of existence and all of life. We have to embrace that. So as we began last week with this big idea of this section here, verses 33 through 36, in light of his transcendence and our limitedness, we should reverently fear worship and be in awe of our Lord God. We began last week with three essentials. Oh, I forgot to change it. I meant to say three essentials instead of two. Three essentials in worshiping our Lord God as we should. Number one was this. A growing sense of God's transcendence. And this comes, of course, out of verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. And, and, and friends, we, we understand this because we can relate to these characteristics of God. Uh, we, we spent last week talking about how God has made us in his image. And the primary way he has done that is giving, uh, he has related to us his character. And his consciousness, his, his ability to judge. And so when we read words like riches and wisdom and knowledge, we, we think about judgments and we think about ways we can relate to those things because we all do that. We understand wealth. We understand wisdom, knowledge. We understand making judgments. We understand choosing a path. But friends, we cannot comprehend God's riches and wisdom and knowledge and judgments and inscrutable because he is so transcendent he's so transcendent and so we read basically all of romans up to this point specifically 9 through 11 and we're blown away with the doctrine of election that we find in chapter 9 we're blown away with the fact that god holds the sinner responsible for his sin chapter 10 we're blown away 
by the idea that God has a plan for the nation of Israel that is coming, and we wait. And, and, we, and God reveals to us through the Apostle Paul these ways and these judgments and this wisdom. And we say, okay, Lord, we can see this, but can't comprehend it. And so we fall in worship. So, so friends, if you're going to be worshiping the Lord as you should, you need to have a growing sense of God's transcendence. Not only that, you need to have an accurate understanding of your limitedness. And that's verses 34 and 35. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And so verse 33 declares God's transcendence. Verses 34 and 35 in the same way declares our limitedness. Our limitedness. Paul develops this in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 through 25. He says this, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Today, friends, let's wrestle with this one. If we're going to rightly worship God, we need to bring ourselves in humble submission to God's purposes and glory. Bring ourselves in humble submission to God's purposes and glory. Verse 36 again, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Friends, again, this is one of the most succinct and powerful statements regarding the nature and purposes of God that we find in Scripture. Be encouraged, friends, to memorize this. It's an easy one, because look at the parallels. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Simple one. To God be the glory forever. Be deeply encouraged, friends, to memorize this verse, to meditate upon it deeply, to find other declarations of this in the Holy Scriptures, and to live daily in light of this reality. Live daily in light of this reality. Now, friends, again, we, we talked about this in verses 33 and 34 and 35. These are relating or dealing with what we would call communicable attributes of God. Attributes of God that he has given to us that we can share in. Although we're limited, we understand justice. We understand making plans. We understand learning wisdom, these types of things. But friends, this verse declares attributes of God that we could and can never possess. These are what we would call incommunicable attributes. Characteristics of God that are utterly different from anything we can understand or grasp his absolute transcendent sovereignty. So as we look at this verse here, it's imperative to understand the nature of God. And as we look at this, and, and this is hinted at in this verse here, and we'll develop it more, but just we need to understand some stuff about the eternal nature of God and who he is. Number one, God is self-existent. God is self-existent. He has no origin. He has never been. He's always been, I'm sorry. He has no origin, and he has always been. Before he created time and space, God existed. He existed. You and I are created dependent beings, aren't we? We didn't plan on our existence. Our parents brought us into the world, but they didn't even really plan the way we are. They didn't think through the days of our lives. They didn't know our genetics, our personality, nothing like that. They said, let's have a kid, and here we are. But, but friends, we had an initial starting point when mom and dad came together. That was our initial starting point. And we are utterly dependent, utterly dependent. And I encourage you, spend some time just in... I'm going to try to get away here in the next couple of weeks just to spend some solitude and silence alone with the Lord for a couple of days and, and just meditate and think. And I, I encourage you just to take some time and think about the ways you are dependent. Think about the ways that you are dependent. We could spend a lot of time there. But God is not that way. He has no origin. 
He has always been. God is the great I am. The great I am. Self-existent. Eternal in his being. Not only is he self-existent, he's self-sufficient. He has no needs. And he's dependent on no one. Again, that's verses 34 and 35. We, we can't give him anything. We don't, our thinking is so much lower than his. And in fact, the, the capacity for us to think at all is a gift from God. It completely is. You and I have countless needs. Countless needs. We need oxygen to breathe. In Acts 17, what do we learn? In him, in God, we live and breathe and have our being. I think some translations, we live and move and have our being. We need oxygen. We need food. We need clothes, houses in which to live. We, we, we need all kinds of things. If we're deprived of any of them, for even a short time, what? We cease. We stop. We die. God needs nothing. In and of himself, he has everything he needs. This is a long quote from James Boyce, so I didn't put it on the screen, but just listen. This runs counter to the ideas that many people have about God. Supposing him to be like themselves, they assume that God needs many things. If not to survive, at least to be happy and fulfilled as God. For example, they imagine that at one time God was lonely and that he created men and women to keep him company. They forget that God is a trinity and he has always had perfectly fulfilling fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Other people suppose that God needs worshipers. But if every individual on the face of the earth became an atheist tomorrow, refusing even to acknowledge God's existence, God would be no more deprived by our atheism than the sun would be deprived of light if all of us should become blind. Still other people suppose that God needs helpers, even suggesting that he created us to help him, quote, get the job done, whatever that is. It's true that God has given us the privilege of doing useful and meaningful work for him. In the Garden of Eden, he gave meaningful work to Eve and Adam. This age of gospel proclamation, he has given us the task of being his evangelists and even called us fellow workers with Jesus Christ. But friends, this does not mean that God needs us. God can manage very well without us and always has done so. That he chooses to use us is due only to his free and utterly sovereign will. Friends, God is self-sufficient. doesn't need us. Not only that, and we talked about this, God is eternal. He's everlasting. God has always been and always will be. He is ever the same in his infinite and eternal being. He is eternally unchanging. What the Bible declares about God is true and will be forever. Forever. For his elect children, for those of us that have been saved by him, he has loved us, what according to Ephesians 1, he has loved us from before the foundation of the world, and what? He will never leave us nor forsake us. Look at what he said to the Israelites, and as I read from that Ezekiel passage, I'm going to give you this new heart, he says, I'm going to bring you back into the land, I'm going to establish myself in Jerusalem, and I'm going to do that. Why? Not for your sake, Israel, but for my name and my glory, I do this. I made a promise to Abraham, and my promises are unbreakable. I, the Lord, do not change, God says through Malachi. Therefore, you are not consumed, O Israel. Israel and you and I deserve to be consumed, but God made a promise. I will not consume you. And God's promises never change. God is inescapable. He's ever-present. He sees not only our words and deeds, but the deep motivations of our heart and mind. And one day, in the not-too-distant future, all of us will give an accounting to God regarding what we have done with our lives. We'll give an accounting. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth... Or ever you had lay, had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Again, friends, I can't encourage you enough to deepen your understanding of the nature and attributes of God. 
And as we'll talk about here, if you want to know yourself, get to know God. Get to know God. Spurgeon from last week. The proper study of God's elect is God. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls Father. Friends, get to know and love your God more and more and more. With this framework in mind, God's self-existence, his self-sufficiency, his eternality. With this framework in mind, let's engage the text of Romans 11.36. Number one, friends, if God is self-existence, he's self-sufficient and eternal, it only makes sense that all things are from him. From him. So, so we can understand that it's out of him. He is the source of everything. The absolute source of everything. What are all things that are declared in the middle of that verse What from him are all things? Well, it's the material universe, right? Everything you can see and experience right now is you look in the telescope and you see the distant galaxies and the the distant stars, the billions of them. As you look in the microscope, you see the minute cellular structures that are going on there. Where did that come from? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then, of course, he goes through the rest of that chapter talking about how he created plants, animals, stars, moon, sun, you, me. He's our source. All things come through him from the physical universe, but not only the material universe that we can actually touch and feel, but the immaterial universe, the things we can't touch, the things we can't feel. Mathematical concepts, scientific understanding of how things work, Two plus two equals four. That's an immaterial reality that is true in every time and in every place and will be as long as the universe exists. And in fact, as we talked about, in the mind of God are the formulas for how this universe works. And if they weren't there, this universe could not have come about, period. So it's mathematical concepts, scientific formulas, but not only that, concepts like beauty, and love. We know these exist, but they're not contingent on something. They exist as immaterial realities. Love is immaterial, but it's real. Consciousness. You guys have all done this. You have some kind of wicked thought that comes into your head that you know dishonors the Lord your God. Maybe it's a profane thought, a lustful thought, a greedy thought, something like that. And what? You know it's wrong. You know it's wrong. What do you do with this? Oh, okay, can I control these things? Or, or this is just me. I, I need to, this is the, this is the, 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 the venue of our, our world today is whatever you feel, you do. But you know that's wrong. You know that's wrong. You know that when you have hateful thoughts, you know that when you're thinking wicked thoughts, and you say, this is wrong. Friends, that's your consciousness. That's your, that's your, your inborn sense of morality that's put there by God. Every single one of us has that. Believer or unbeliever, you know right and wrong exist. And you know that when you're doing something wrong, you should stop. Friends, that's an immaterial existence. That's an immaterial reality. You and me. Again, where did we come from individually? So yeah, we can say our parents decided, or maybe you were a, whoops, baby, I don't know. But maybe your parents decided, let's have a child, okay? But friends, here's the thing that you need to understand. And this is really helpful for you that, and me, who, who might look back on our past and, and be upset about the way things happened and want to blame somebody else. Want to blame our parents. Want to blame our upbringing for the problems we have. Well, here's the source of who you are, friends. For you, God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. 
I don't want to sound crass, and I don't mean it to be. There's at least two people pregnant in this room, I think, maybe more. That's a beautiful and amazing thing. It really is. It's a gift from God. But friends, God is the one who's doing that. God is the one who opens the womb. God is the one who puts the child together in there. You need to live in light of that. Your source is God, friends. If anything exists, it's because God made it, period. He is the uncaused first cause. The uncaused first cause. Not only is everything from God, the creator of all things, everything is, everything that is, is sustained and maintained by God. It's through him. Look at this verse. We have from him, through him, and to him. Okay, so, so we, have, we have a chronological arrangement of things here a little bit. That everything that exists, that we see, that came about in the past, was created by God. The reality that anything is existing right now is because God is sustaining it. It's through him. And then, of course, to him. A future aspect of his purposes and plans. Everything is sustained and maintained by God through him. Now, I'm going to offend some people I don't like. I'm agnostic about global warming and climate change. Some of you are saying in your mind right now, how could he possibly deny that reality? Others of you are saying, this is the biggest joke that's ever been foisted upon the world. I'm agnostic. But one thing, friends, I know about our environment that I'm absolutely sure of is this. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. You know the passage. This is after the flood. Noah's ark is... Noah and his ark are on the mountains of Ararat. They've come back out, and Noah leaves the ark. And it says this in verse 20 of chapter 8, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike down every living creature as I have done. And here's what I know. While the earth remains, until God decides to shut this place down, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Amen? That's God's work, friends. That's God's work. That doesn't mean we can, you know, if, if you want to be, follow the, the Genesis mandate to be a, a steward of what God gives you, you should be doing that. So work that out how you want. But friends, fall back on the reality. Fall back on the reality that God has made a promise to sustain this earth until he's done with the universe. So, so there's that big promise but, but then, then there's this as well, too, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him, now again, this him here is Jesus. And Jesus is the agent who actually created for God. This is a complex topic. God ordains the creation of the universe. Jesus actually does the work. Okay? Jesus does the work, and the Holy Spirit declares the work. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by Jesus, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Just practical. Donald Trump is in the White House because God put him there. Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House because God put her there. He used the secondary means of voting on our behalf, but there is no authority that exists except those that God establishes. Complex, deep stuff, I understand. How does this all fit together? How does Donald Trump work out God's plan? How does, you get it. You get it. So, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, through Jesus and for Jesus, and Jesus is before all things, and what? In him, all things hold together. So right now, Jesus is holding the very atoms of your body together. He's the God particle, right? 
if you're familiar with that phraseology. He's the glue of this universe. By his word, you are sustained. By his word, you live. And by his word, you will die. Here's Psalm 139, 16. Again, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet not, there was not one of them, there was none of them. Friends, your life is held together by God. This universe is sustained by God. He knows the day of your conception. He knows the day of your birth. And he knows the day of your death. That's the implication of Psalm 139 there. Beloved, anything that exists in time and space, including you and me, is created and sustained by God. It is through him. It is through him. Not only is everything from God and through God, all things are to God. Everything that exists and is sustained by God is to exalt and glorify God. Him. So this word here that, that, that's translated to, it's this three-letter word, ice, E. Well, for us, it's E-I-S. But, 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 but most often it's translated as to. But it can be also translated as into or in or for. The NIV renders it that way. All things are for God. And that's helpful for us. Friends, God is doing all things to draw attention to his glory. And so Paul says at the end here, to him be the glory forever. Amen. So as we understand, God created everything. Why did he do it? For his glory. Created the universe for his glory. He created the, the dust mites for his glory. He created you and me for his glory. He sustains everything right now for his glory. And friends, one day in the consummation of all things, everything will glorify him. Everything will glorify him. Well, let's talk about some implications and applications of this. Number one, friends, as we walk away from Romans 11 or 9 through 11, this should be abundantly clear. God is 100% in control of history. Right? He's the primary cause of what's going on here and what's doing. You and I and people are the secondary cause, yes. Your decisions that you make and the actions that you do are meaningful and real. But God is working through those to achieve what he wants. Events are not arbitrary. They're not ambivalent. They have a purpose in God's plans. We may not be able to ascertain that at this moment. We, not be, we may not be able to see how this particular action leads to God's glory here. Or we may not be understand why things are going the way they are and how is this going to work itself out. But based on this reality that we've just studied here today, we know that God is in absolute control of history. Look at Romans 9 through 11 that we've just talked about. Well, the question, why are not the Jews in mosque coming to saving faith in Christ? Because except for a remnant, they're not elect. Secondly, they're rejecting the gospel. But don't lose hope, God says, because one day all Israel will be saved. Come back and take a look at that one on the on the website. History, friends, is moving towards God's ordained end. It's moving towards God's ordained end. Friends, God is abundantly aware of and sustaining and observing your life. One of the things that I've seen in some debates about the moral, the moral issues of the day, someone will say, God isn't concerned about what I'm doing over here. Why do you make a big deal of these things? Totally opposed to what the scriptures say. Our thoughts, our words, our deeds are known by him. Are known by him. Here's just one verse. One verse. Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, Jesus says, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Friends, if, if we're going to give an account for every careless word, then God knows every careless word, Right? For those of us who are believers, the reality of God being abundantly aware, aware of, sustaining and observing our life, that, that is a huge blessing, isn't it? The realization that my days and your days are ordained by him and watched over, that, that 
our death, however it may occur, either it's a, a disease or it's sudden, will surprise us, but it doesn't surprise him. It doesn't surprise him. And we can rest in that reality. Friends, what did I do here? Your life, go back. Yeah, I missed that. Your life is ultimately not about you. It's not about you. You, you, hear it in, you hear it in the media today. You hear it in, in commercials or advertisements. You deserve this car. You deserve this vacation. You deserve whatever. Because you are awesome. You need to find out your identity. You need to look deep within yourself. Try to parse it all out and find your identity. I need to find my purpose. I need to find my purpose. Hear me when I say this. You don't need to find your purpose. You don't. Rather, what you need is you need to discover God's purpose as it's revealed in his word and bring your life under his lordship and direction. And as you do so, friends, your purpose will be found and great joy will be found. It's, it's, a, it's a paradox. It's ironic. We find our purpose, we find our joy, we find our meaning when we're not looking for it. We find it when we're seeking the glory of the Lord Here's Jesus' word. And look what he says here. There, there, there's, there, there's, there's a challenge here, a difficult challenge, but then there's an amazing blessing. And he, Jesus, said to all, if anyone would come after me, what? Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Notice that this isn't a one-time event. It's a daily decision to follow Jesus Christ at the expense and even embracing the difficulties that I might find. For whoever would save his life, the ones who are pursuing safety and self-identity and all of this stuff that this world says is meaningful, forever, for whoever would save his life, what will lose it, Jesus says. But what? Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Friends, again, do you want to experience amazing joy? Do you want to have meaningful purpose in your life? Do you, do you want to be defined in a way that blesses God for all eternity? Then stop seeking those things and seek God. Seek God. Friends, the difficulties... And the hardships and evil of this life are not purposeless and they're not meaningless. They're not. Think about Johnny Erickson Tata. Many of you know her. Broke her neck when she was 18. I think she's in her 60s now. She's been a quadriplegic all her life. And if you read some of her biographical stuff, you'll, you'll understand that, that this was tough. She wanted to heal. She didn't understand why God would do something like this. But now when you hear her, she says, I'm thankful God did this, and I don't want him to take it away. Because it's led to incredible peace and joy in the midst of a horrible, horrible event. Friends, I don't know what you're going through right now. You know. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you have some chronic disease. Maybe you have a loved one who's really sick or something else. You, you're, you're unhealthy yourself. You can't get through this. You're, you're, you struggle with depression. You struggle with perspective. You struggle with all of these types of things. Friends, go ahead and keep on engaging. Keep seeking God's blessing and relief in these things. But know, brothers and sisters, everything that's happening if you're a believer today, is for your good and for his glory. That doesn't mean you're going to understand it all the time. But we don't rest on what we can comprehend in our minds. We rest on the promises of God. We stand there. 
And if you need proof of this, there's just one place to look. The cross. The cross. All of God's dynamic, communicable and incommunicable attributes are manifested there. They're seen there. And the scriptures declare without equivocation that the crucifixion and murder of Jesus Christ was the absolute most heinous sin that has ever occurred on the face of the earth. The one perfectly innocent man dies for the sins of literally millions. Unjust. Unjust. But what? But what? God says this occurred according to my foreknowledge and plan and it is meant ultimately as an incredible blessing. So friends, as you wrestle through, as you wrestle through the difficulties and hardships of your life, you, you might come to me or some other pastor or you might go to a counselor or a friend and you say, why is this happening? And, and friends, if I have an answer, I'll try to give it to you. But friends, I may just say, I have no idea why this is happening. None. But here's what I know. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're following him, he's working this for good right now. He's making you more like Jesus, and he's bringing you the capacity to worship him more and more and more. Friends, the difficulties and hardships and evil of this life, even the grand murders and genocides, which we look at and go, what? God is working. God is working. Friends, most importantly, the gospel is from him and through him and to him. From before the foundation of the world, God set apart a people for his own possession. And he instituted the means by which that would happen he gave us his law, which we break and fail. He revealed our sin to us. And then he sent his perfect son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life, to die the death we could never die, and to be raised again for his purposes and for his glory. And as we do that, friends, as we embrace this gospel, we realize these things, and we experience the incredible blessings of being known by God and saved by him. But again, no, friends. This universe, your life, is not about you. It's about God. It's about his glory. Here's James Boyce again. Moreover, <clears throat> that plan of salvation is to his glory. To be sure, it also achieves an eternity of blessing for those who are redeemed. We benefit greatly and will praise God forever and ever, thanking him for what he has done for us. But if you understand what Paul has been writing about in Romans 9 through 11, you will know that our happiness is not God's chief purpose in the ordering the plan of salvation he has. All you have to ask is this. Why are some chosen to be saved while others are passed over? Why are some brought to faith and while others are rejected? The answer is that salvation is for God's glory and God is glorified in each case. In the case of the elect, in the case of those who are saved, the love, mercy, and grace of God are abundantly displayed. In the case of the lost, the patience, power, and wrath of God are equally lifted up. Let me say to you with complete confidence based on the word of God here today, every person in this room, every person who has ever lived on this earth or will live on this earth, you will glorify God that person will glorify God. For the unbeliever who's alive today, God is glorifying his patience in you, not destroying you as your sins deserve and as my sins deserve. He is patient, and he's keeping the door open for the gospel while you live. But friends, if you refuse, if you refuse to bow your knee, admit your sinfulness, Admit your brokenness. Admit your rebellion. Then, friends, for all eternity, you will glorify God as a vessel of his judgment and wrath. And in ways that we can't understand and even horrify us, the judgment and wrath of God poured out on sinners is a good and glorious thing. And if you understand yourself rightly, you know that. 
you know that before you were saved, it would be good and right for God to pour his wrath out on you. The fact that he didn't is an amazing testimony of his patience, his kindness. Time to quit? Almost done. Unbeliever, you will be a vessel of God's glory. Believer, the saved one here today, you are a vessel of God's glory. How so? Because God has poured out his grace and mercy upon you. God has displayed his unending patience in great love and determination to bless. Friends, God is glorifying himself by showing what he can do to a broken, wretched sinner, and he can make you new. Friends, brothers and sisters, don't be. You, you, yes, again, we understand there's election. We understand that no man can come to Christ unless God draws him. But the way that he draws him is through the preaching and articulation of God's word, and you're here today. You're here today. My friends, don't glorify God by being a vessel of his judgment and wrath. Come to saving faith in Christ. Believe in him for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And glorify him by being a vessel of his mercy, love, and grace. Well, what should we do with this? Next January, coming up here in just a little about a month, we'll jump into Romans chapter 12. And we might be in Romans for another year or five. But friends, all of Romans 1 through 11 is what? It's doctrine. It's declarations of God's character and his purposes and plans. And then chapter 12 is a new day, isn't it? Therefore, what? In light of everything we know about the nature and character of God, in light of seeing what his plan is, in light of embracing the gospel, what do we do? Therefore, my beloved brethren, by the mercies of God, make your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spirit, which is your appropriate act of wisdom or worship. I'm sorry. Appropriate act of worship. I butchered it. Well, why don't I just read it now? Friends, in light of his transcendence and our limitedness, we should reverently fear, worship, and be in awe of our Lord God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Let's do some singing, friends. <clears throat>